No matter who you are, you can be interested in science. You're listening to The Cosmic Cast. Hello and welcome to the Women in Science Day special for The Cosmic Cast. Today, me, Marissa Lowe, I'm joined by third year PhD student, Amy Smith. Hello. Senior lecturer in igneous petrology, Margaret Hartley. Hi, everyone. And Rianne Jones, reader in isotope geochemistry and cosmochemistry. Hello. Uh, And thank you very much for tuning in this week. Uh, It's a very special episode of the podcast. It's um, International Women in Science Day, which was an initiative set up by the United Nations about five years ago to address uh, the imbalances and issues in gender that uh, we see in STEM today. Uh, So just to start with, I thought we'd um, introduce all of our guests and give them a chance to talk about uh, what the what research they do here in Manchester. Uh, So Rianne, would you mind telling us a bit about uh, what your research is about? Okay. well, I work on meteorites and mostly I work on a particular group of meteorites called chondrites. And chondrites are a type of rock. Meteorites obviously fall out of the sky and chondrites are a special type of rock. Um, They come from asteroids and they tell us about the formation and the early days of the history of the solar system, as well as what it's like on asteroids today. Fantastic. Um, So what sorts of different techniques do you use to study these meteorites? I use a lot of microscopy. So I use just a normal microscope, light microscope, and I use scanning electron microscopy. I use something called an electron microprobe, which is something that we use to analyse mineral grains, very, very small spots on mineral grains. Um, I use what's called a secondary iron mass spectrometer, which is a technique where we can measure isotopes in little spots on mineral grains. And um, I also do experiments where I cook up different minerals and rocks in the lab. Amy can talk a bit more about that. (laughs) Yeah, so I suppose that leads quite nicely into your PhD project, Amy. Uh, Yeah, so like Rianne, I study meteorites as well, Uh, the group being the same, chondrites. But what I look at is there's little igneous components in those rocks, and um, they're basically made up of minerals like olivine and pyroxene, and there's all different textures associated with them, and no one really knows how they formed. Some planetary science are like a big cause of controversy. So what I do is I look at them in natural meteorites, and then I do experiments to try and constrain how they form, and then help understand them, basically. Yeah, because uh, these uh, minerals, these grains, chondrules, are quite important for planetary science, aren't they? Yeah, so like they're like the second oldest objects that we have, and they're thought to be the building blocks of of planets so understanding the mechanism that formed them might give some insight into like planetary formation and other solar systems yeah that's really cool cool. so you're basically trying to recreate in the lab how this early solar system material formed yeah yeah Yeah, it's really exciting stuff yeah so uh, what sort of different techniques or equipment do you use to do that so similar to rihanna do a lot of microscopy so look at scanning an electron microscope and the electron microprobe as well i also use ramen um So within these kind of chondrules, I look at silica polymorphs. So the ramen helps determine which is there. Um, And because basically each polymorph has its own temperature that it forms at. So for me, determining what polymorph there helps um, determine how these things formed. So I use ramen on top of everything else, basically. And uh, how has it been going so far? It's gone, it's gone okay. I'm a third year PhD student now, so the stress is hitting. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm almost finishing the first part of my project. Most of my experiments are done for that side of things. And I'm moving on to a slightly different part of my project now. So hopefully all goes well and I'll be finished in March next year. That's very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so maybe moving down to earth now. Uh, Margaret, would you mind telling us a bit about what you do? Sure. Uh, I'm an igneous petrologist and... A lot of my work concerns Icelandic volcanoes. Iceland is a fantastic country, not least because it has over 30 volcanic systems, some of which have produced some of the largest basaltic eruptions in Earth's history. Uh, One of those was the Lackey Fisher eruption in 1783, which went on for about 10 months and produced very large quantities of toxic gases. It's been associated with uh, an elevated death rate in uh, Northern Europe, respiratory problems um, for uh, people 
who lived in England. Um, so we're interested in this kind of uh, eruption because there are obvious knock-on hazards for uh, for us today, whether that's uh, ash clouds or um, people with illnesses. Um, you know, we want to be prepared so that we can understand what we need to do in the event of one of these eruptions. So one of the things that I'm interested in is can we use volcanic gases as a tool for understanding when a volcano is getting ready to erupt and potentially how long it, it is before we see a spike in gas emissions that might tell us that something big is coming. So I use uh, uh, rocks that have been erupted from uh, previous eruptions and I try to measure the gas chemistry in them that gives us an idea of what's going on in the magma chamber. And if we understand how past eruptions have behaved, then we can forward cast to how future eruptions might be predicted to unfold. That's amazing. And uh, yeah, having been to Iceland myself, it's a completely different world, it feels like. It feels like you're on another planet uh, with the geology that's there. Um, have you gotten to do a lot of field work during your career? Yes, uh, field work is one of my absolute highlights. I've spent a lot of summers driving around Iceland in a four-wheel drive truck and collecting lots of rocks to bring back to the lab. Amazing. Uh, so uh, what specifically are you looking for in these rocks? We're looking particularly for tephra. So this is the kind of explosive product that quenches rapidly in the air. Uh, lava flows don't preserve quite the amount of information that I want. So I'm looking for kind of ash and, and dust that's been produced by the volcanoes. So we can go and take a shovel, dig into the soil and try and collect uh, some of this fresh tephra fall. So we're looking for very, very pristine rocks that haven't undergone lots of alteration in the soil um, they look shiny uh, they, look, they look good on a shelf <laughs> so it'd be great to talk to each of you about how you got to where you are today then um so perhaps margaret you'd like to start and sort of say what your background is sure i went to university to study natural sciences and when i arrived at university i was pretty sure that i wanted to be a chemist and I took earth sciences as a fun bit on the side module and discovered that it was fantastically interesting and that I enjoyed it. When I got to my fourth year of undergraduate, I quite wanted to go into the mining industry, but I wasn't able to get a job or an internship and I didn't really know, uh, didn't really know what to, to do next. Uh, fortunately, I'd applied for a couple of PhDs and been offered them and uh, ended up going to Edinburgh to study for a PhD on Icelandic volcanology. And I've never managed to escape the academic system since. I guess <laughs> <laughs> I've gone through the fairly traditional route of do your PhD, do a postdoc, get a fellowship, get a job. Mm -hmm. um, but it hasn't been quite as plain sailing as I might make it sound. At the end of my first postdoc, I uh, was applying for lots of fellowships and having very little success. I had an interview for a fellowship on the same day as I had an interview for a job in industry. And despite the fact that I was offered both and the job in industry was a permanent position with uh, at least twice the salary, I chose to stay in academia. So make of that what you will. <laughs> um, and then how long have you been here at Manchester for? I've been here for just over five years now. Um, and you're a lecturer here, so you're heavily involved with teaching different modules or? Yeah, I've, I've taught a variety of modules since I've been here. I started off on one that was on volcanic and seismic hazards, which was a little bit outside my subject area. Mm -hmm. And I've now uh, inherited a, a second year igneous petrology class, which I absolutely love. I also teach uh, mapping projects, students, uh, take them out into the field. I'm involved in one of the volcanology field trips. Um, so yes, I do quite a bit of field teaching as well. So have you mostly stayed within Icelandic geology during your academic career? My main focus has been on Icelandic geology, but I've also got PhD students who are working on the Canary Islands, uh, who are working on uh, lunar rocks from the Apollo missions. I'd like to be able to work on a wider variety of igneous rocks. It's just a question of getting the funding to do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what about yourself then, Rianne? Well, I didn't realise that you were intending to be a chemist, but I actually did a whole degree in chemistry. It's the same kind of thing. Um, I did an optional module and I chose mineralogy and really enjoyed it. Um, and then I, after, after I'd done my undergraduate... I actually went and did a 
PGCE, Postgraduate Certificate in Education, for doing high school teaching, um, doing chemistry, and I didn't like that. But then I saw an advert for a PhD in geology, actually here in Manchester, which I was... I felt like I could slide sideways into geology from chemistry to do that project because it was a project doing experimental petrology. So I, I, I switched from chemistry to geology. Um, then after my PhD, I was looking for an opportunity for a postdoc and was offered one studying meteorites in Albuquerque in New Mexico, um, which was just totally not anything I knew anything about but I thought it seemed like an exciting adventure to go to New Mexico for a couple of years um, but I stayed there for 27 years in the end <laughs> wow so I sort of got stuck um, and so during that time I progressed from being a postdoc to a research associate and then moved into an academic position and started doing more teaching um, and then I moved to Manchester at the same time as Margaret, just over five years ago. Um, so your PhD was more in terrestrial geology then, or was it planetary related? Uh, my PhD was related to terrestrial rocks. It was experimental petrology. It was looking at potassium-rich systems, um, systems that produce potassium-rich lavas. But I didn't really look at rocks. I was really just doing experiments. So I only started working on meteorites when I went to do the postdoc that I went to do. So the, re the reason that they appointed me to do that was because I knew about experimental petrology and they wanted someone to apply experimental petrology to meteorites. Um, so you said you were only planning on being in New Mexico for like a couple of years, but yes. then it ended up being 27, did you say? Yeah, that's right. At yep. what point did, did you realise uh, that you were going to be there for such a long time in the long term? Well, it just went on and on, basically. I didn't ever realise at any particular point that I was there for for an extended period. It just sort of, two years became five years, became 10 years, became 20 years, and it just sort of, time rolled along. Yeah, I feel yeah. you hear that from a lot of academics who aren't quite sure how long their position is going to be at a certain university, that they just sort of you know, see how long it can last for and, you know, see how contracts work out and so on. Well, I had a job. I had a permanent job. So mm. I was I was in that job and you sort of see that as, well, it could last forever, but you don't really think about, do I really want it to last forever? Or, you know, when do I want to be here for 10 years? Do I want to be here for 20 years or whatever? You just sort of take it as it comes, I suppose. Mm. Um, and then Amy, what about you? Uh, obviously not quite as long of a <laughs> no. career to talk about, but uh, how did you start out in geology? Well, actually from school I applied to do geography at um, university. So when I first went to university I was studying just geography alongside um, air science and then I had like a little space module that you could do as well at Glasgow. And I never actually liked geology at my first year of uni. I thought I was definitely going to do geography. I don't know what I thought I was going to do. But when I got into second year, I realised that um, I like the physical aspect of geography. And that's basically what geology is, and it's more detailed. So in second year, that's when geology really picked up for me, and I decided to switch. So, I, yeah, I did that. I had to drop the space module, but I was always really interested in planetary stuff. But um, at Glasgow at the time, in air science, planetary science wasn't like a module you could take. And then I did my fourth year project, um, and it was to do with accretionary, accretionary lapilli. And I really enjoyed like the research as aspect of it. In Glasgow, you do your map and dissertation, and then like a research project. And once I finished, I definitely wanted to do more, definitely more research. And I got talking to some of the planetary people at Glasgow and um, they came up with a project for me to do a research master's. So I stayed in Glasgow for an extra year um, and I was looking at um, Martian meteorites basically and appetite in them. And then from there I knew I wanted to do a PhD because I really enjoyed the research I was doing. And I uh, seen the one in Glasgow that Rianne had advertised <laughs> um, about chondrules and I started doing the reading into it and it really, really interested me and I thought it might be nice. I did a bit of Martian, so to move on to chondrites was like a nice change. And yeah, and now I've been here for coming up three years. I due to finish in March and then, 
yeah we'll see what happens with my career <laughs> <laughs> this is just the beginning I know. <laughs> um so was it a geochemistry based master's project then that you were looking at I uh, know it was so it still come, came under earth science but there was there was chemistry aspects to it because I was doing the chemistry of appetite basically um but yeah um so at Glasgow it's not like here they didn't offer integrated masters at the time so that I was like their first research master student mm. and then after I left they now they got like loads of people in now and research masters seem to be happening quite a lot there and they've got a new degree program with their integrated masters as well now in earth science um yeah um so I did a taught masters myself so it was sort of two terms of actual modules and then a term of doing your own dissertation but research masters do sound a really good way to actually get the experience for a PhD you know learning by doing and being left to your own devices sort of for a year yeah I think I think that's definitely what helped me get the PhD here because when they realized I think in England it's more like uh, an MPhil rather than research masters that's basically what mine was but when I came from an interview here they were just more interested in all the experience I had. So I was really lucky in my master's because I got to go to Hawaii to use the Sims over there. Um, and because of that, I think because they knew I was doing like a work at that level, they thought, oh, well, yeah, you'd be able to come and use machines here. Mm-hmm. So I think it was the experience that like, I had a whole year of experience yeah. that clearly helped. <laughs> yeah. And also planning a long term project. Definitely yeah. That would have been helpful because, yeah. yeah, you know, when we start PhDs, we're faced with three to four years uh a big expanse of time and can be quite intimidating as we probably know it's funny to hear that we've all had quite similar experiences when it comes to entering the world of geology uh something that we've heard from lots of guests on the podcast is that a lot of people don't really know what geology is until they get to university or even i mean in my case i uh so similar to you i was very similar to you amy i was very interested in physical geography but also chemistry a bit of physics um so I went on to do earth sciences for my undergraduate degree and I didn't really realize that that meant geology as silly as that sounds um I didn't really understand what that meant until I started the course and I went oh wow there's a whole world of science here that I didn't realize existed um but I mean obviously we can all agree how amazing geology is it is a wonderful mix of all of the other sciences but it is strange how awareness of it uh is so low yeah. i guess many of us haven't had a chance to study it at school or yeah. uh, at a level so you go to university and, and think oh i need a timetable filler uh, i like science <laughs> yeah what shall i do um, but for the people who do have the opportunity to study geography or geology at, at school and university i think that's a really good way in mm. um so i don't know what it was like when you were doing your degrees but i remember when i was uh in first year i'd say around one in three people in my undergraduate class had done geology at uh, sixth form. I'd say it's less from mine. Mm. It was definitely less from mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had. It's, it's very low now. Um, maybe we'll get onto this, but I'm I'm the academic lead for admissions in our department, so I'm seeing a lot of students who are applying to our degree programs, and. Um, geology is being taught less and less at a level in schools so we're really trying to encourage students who just enjoy science all kinds of science chemistry physics biology maths geology um, all those different science topics to think about earth sciences because it's a really nice combination of everything yeah definitely um it's a shame to hear that it's being taught less in schools i was hoping you know it would be on on the rise since i did my uh undergrad degree I think it's being taught less because they've changed the A-level structure. So students are now focusing on just single sciences like chemistry and physics rather than choosing geology. And schools just don't have the resources to have a geology teacher, less and less geology teachers in um, in our schools, basically. Um, in Scotland in particular, geology isn't something that's taught. I think there's maybe like two schools in Scotland that do it because, yeah, I don't know if it's a resource thing, but... We have the same exam board in Scotland, so I think if you want to go down that, you have to go through, schools have to go through a really lengthy process to try and get it all sorted and make sure it's at the same, I don't know, quality as everything else, but um, yeah, not many schools have resources to do that, and then they might not have the pupils interested enough to do it, mm. so a lot of, yeah, a lot of people that I went to uni with had done geography. Um, and I went to a careers advisor in school and I told um, him I really liked physical geography, so I was 
going to naturally go do geography but he told me like geology wasn't a subject because that's what I was explaining to him and it wasn't mm. realized till I went into university I was like because I was saying like oh you know volcanoes plate tectonics yeah and he said yeah yeah just do geography like there's nothing else for you and then I got into university and obviously earth science that's basically what earth science is a whole mix of things and I was like this does exist then mm, yeah, that's such a shame you think for a career advisor yeah. that they'd have a bit more awareness yeah. of at least the span of subjects that you could do at university yeah yeah I think geology suffers from a bit of an image problem sometimes that we think of it as being a bit of a gentleman's science mm. where you dress mm. up in your tweed coat and you <laughs> go and collect dusty trilobites yeah and it's so much more than that yeah yeah, yeah exactly it's even just your yeah on the beach as a child or something with your family or mm. wherever and yeah, yeah you find some interesting looking rocks or some fossils or something and that yeah but it's it's history it's science it's um it, huge world changing events like volcanoes like earthquakes it's um the evolution of life it's the evolution of planetary systems you know there's so much to be excited about in geology and it's such a shame that uh, we don't get the opportunity to study that from a really young age. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Can we not have like a video for this of just us all like being like, yeah, <laughs> geology? <laughs> but so, I mean, that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday we had a group of sixth form students in here just finding out about what earth sciences is all about. And they were all doing biology and chemistry A-levels and only one of them was doing geology A-level but they had come to just investigate what what is this science and mm. what what would I learn in this kind of degree. So we want to get the message out there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Margaret, as you were saying, it is very much seen as a maybe an old man's club or like uh, people just wanting to go into oil and gas. But obviously now with concerns about the climate, it's becoming more and more obvious that geology is an important subject and doesn't just look at fossil fuels. Yes, a lot more than that. And yeah. I guess um, many of us will have uh, friends and uh, classmates who have gone on to work in the fossil fuels industry, but by no means all of them. There's a, a huge range of career options out there. Yeah, exactly. I think um, the options are definitely changing, uh, especially for us PhD students. There's all sorts of uh, avenues you can go down in geology now that aren't just petroleum science. Yeah. One of the things I found out about only recently is that uh, if we want to go down the route of renewable energy, well, we need quite a lot of metal resources to make the components that go into things like electric cars. So I found out at a conference it takes eight times more copper to manufacture an electric car than it does to manufacture a regular car. And that copper has got to come from somewhere. Mm. So you need geologists who understand where these copper deposits can be found and how to extract them from the ground in a, an environmentally responsible way. Yeah. This is going to be a huge uh, opportunity of employment for ge geoscience graduates. And I think that it's not being talked about enough. You know, we, we really need people who have the skills of understanding how the earth works mm. to, to be able to transition to a renewable energy uh, uh, economy economy <laughs> thank you Rianne. <laughs> um, but yeah that's really interesting because I suppose it's more just the pure benefits of electric cars that are normally quoted so um yeah hearing mm. about the sort of potential problems that might come up along the way is really interesting uh, so one of the reasons why I've invited you all on today other than you all being fantastic scientists who I really wanted to hear from uh, is so we could discuss some of the problems that women in science face today. Um, so just to sort of set the scene a bit, um, in a study by UCAS, uh, it was found that uh, from 2017 to 2019, uh, only 20 to 21 percent of the STEM workforce were women. Um, and as we were talking about behind the scenes, um, this problem of the leaky pipeline in academia, how the proportion of women in academic positions as you go from PhD student to postdoc to research fellow to lecturer to professor, the proportion of women is constantly falling as you look up through the academic uh, workforce. Um, so I suppose my question for you today is, um, do you think that being a woman in science has affected your career? And if you do think it has, uh, how, in what way? So, yeah, I think being a woman in science has definitely affected different things at different points in my career. And um, that can be both positive and negative, I think. I think especially when 
I was at an earlier stage in my career, there were very, very few women around, especially in planetary sciences. So you sort of, you're quite visible in a way, which gives you a little bit of a, a extra visibility, a little bit of an advantage in some ways, because you sort of special, you stand out, you're different. And um, that can be good and bad. <laughs> you have to make sure that you don't screw up. Mm. Um, but I, I think that sort of, that visibility is something that can be an advantage. And, and I've always had some very good friends and mentors around me who've supported me throughout my career and um, really appreciate that. And most of them are male because out of my contemporaries, there are not so many female um, female scientists. Um, I think that one of the obviously one of the big things with women is the issue of having a family and bringing up children and that is very difficult to manage um i think in an academic career it's quite difficult to manage it's a very demanding job it's a very full on job and having children you're constantly trying to juggle a lot of different things um which is just what everybody in every different walk of life has to try and do um in academic in an academic world you have a huge amount of flexibility which is really good when you've got children and you maybe need to stay at home with one of them take them to a doctor something like that you, you have a lot of flexibility about your working day your working hours um being able to perhaps pick them up from school and go home and do some work later in the evening after they've gone to bed. Nobody really keeps track of your hours or pays attention to you um, clocking in or clocking out or having to stick to regular office hours. So you do have a lot of flexibility and that's a really good advantage. But I think that at the same time, women often put their families first and their careers second in terms of priorities and that can sort of set you on a just a slower trajectory through the academic world and um i don't i i feel like i did that um i don't regret it one little bit because i have two fantastic children and i love them to bits and i wouldn't have not done it i wouldn't have done it any other way mm -hmm. um but in terms of your academic career and progress through your academic career it can put you on what they call the mummy track I mm. suppose this is a, sort of a slower track through life yeah that's uh, absolutely fine with me yeah but. um going back to what you were saying about feeling like the odd one out um I remember during my a-level physics uh, course uh I think I was the only f female out of a class of 16 um and I definitely noticed sort of being singled out by my teacher at the time he'd sort of go around the class um he of course uh would sort of go around the class and ask how everyone else was doing and then very much come to me at the end and you know give me a bit of special care and attention because I think he thought oh well she's the only girl in the class you know singling me out a bit I guess in a good way it meant that I did have the opportunity to ask for help but also I didn't want to feel like that all of the time um and also you feel a bit of pressure don't you like to do well because yeah. you think oh well I'm the only girl in the class I need to maybe prove a point and um, make mm -hmm. sure I do well because otherwise it's going to look bad um, if the girls aren't doing as well as the guys but it's a lot of pressure. I think so yeah yeah I think you're quite right mm. yeah. Yeah I guess I didn't have that experience because I went to a girls school and oh. I was used to having female science teachers and being in a class of girls and even though the sixth form was mixed um, most of my science classes were majority female uh, so and, and again when I went to university I think earth sciences at an undergraduate level is or was about 50 50 uh, male female so I don't think I ever really noticed that I uh, was in a minority until I was in staff meetings here and and realized that I was seeing the leaky pipeline that there are a number of uh, I guess junior faculty here in this department but very few women at very senior positions and in some ways I would expect that to be the case because society has changed and the demographic at the, the very senior professorial levels reflects uh, how society was 20, 30, 40 years ago and it'll be very interesting to see if and how that pipeline, 
changes over the next decade. Mm, yeah, definitely. Uh, just touching what uh, you were saying, Rissa. Um So yeah, I did, I did uh, equivalent A-level physics at high school. I had a male physics teacher and I was one of three girls in like a class of 30. Mm-hmm. But I think I was really fortunate because that was similar to most of our science classes, but I didn't ever felt like I was treated any differently to the rest of the class. And I think that just shows well on my physics teacher. But then I think also it's helped me in research is when I've done kind of more academic work, like my master's and my PhD, I've had, I've always had female supervisors. Mm-hmm. So in Glasgow, I had my master's supervisor, Lydia, she was female and then I've got Rianne. So I don't know if that's made me, I don't know, not really, I think I've been fortunate not experienced anything like any sort of major inequality. And when I first did my undergrad, I would say that um, our science was 50-50 split with like girls and guys. So it was yeah. like, yeah, I don't think I've really noticed, but obviously as you're going higher up and like, well, now we're at the stage where we might go into postdocs and you're looking mm-hmm. for positions. I don't know if then I will see what's that, like see any difference in that maybe. Yeah. Um. So I was doing a bit of reading up before recording this Um. into the leaky pipeline and how people's perceptions change Um, and there was a study by the Royal Society of Chemistry Uh, they were asking male and female PhD students what their intentions were after finishing their PhD Um, and it was something like 80 or 70 percent said that they were hoping to pursue a career in academia Um, and then they surveyed these people again uh, during their third and fourth years Um, and for the males uh, that proportion had dropped down to about 50 percent uh, but for the women, they noticed that it dropped down to about 25%, which is obviously quite worrying. And obviously we're at this stage now yeah. where we're thinking about what to do after our PhDs. Um, and it's just quite scary. Obviously, this was just one study. This was for chemistry. But how something about the system really changes our perceptions and our career plans. Mm-hmm. I think one of the big issues in science in general, and probably in our field too, is that the whole way that academia is set up, Margaret was talking about how you do a postdoc, maybe two, a couple of postdocs and then a fellowship, and then if you're lucky, you end up in a permanent academic position. But there's that period where you're sort of expected to be mobile and you, you're expected to go to different institutions and spend a couple of years in different institutions, getting a lot of experience, building up a lot of different collaborations. It's for, for many people, that's one of the most productive times of their scientific career because that's when they're really establishing their research program. Um, but I think that women tend to not want to be mobile like that or women tend to make more compromises with their partner to um, not not take up opportunities that would make them go to lots of different institutions and have these sort of short-term posts in different countries, different parts of this country. Um, so I think that, that issue of mobility is underlies a lot of the problems of progressing in academic careers Um, and also it's at a time when a lot of women are thinking about families and um, if you if having a family coincides with that period of postdoc multiple postdoc times it's very very difficult I think to to um, continue in academics through that you've got to be very persistent I think as well as like so your publication record is something that's really important in academia and if you take like a year out because you've got a child, then if you're applying for different postdocs or if you have more than one child and you've taken more than a year out from maternity, they see gaps in your research and publication history. And I don't know if that then could affect to someone who didn't have kids and, their, and the mobility thing as well, if you've taken time out to have kids. I think the, I think the it, time out question is not... I mean, people when when people are interviewing for positions mm-hmm. these days are very very much aware of career gaps mm-hmm. and um they pe- people do take that into account oh, okay. so it, it's it's not something that i mean it used to be you know, 30 years ago or something it was quite obvious that people would see that as a, a huge problem in your cv but mm-hmm. these days there's a lot more awareness that you've taken time out but i think that 
there's a, a more persisting problem, which is that women are often the main carer for their children. And so you don't have time in the evenings, time at weekends to do all the extra stuff that writing papers and academic life requires. And so you sort of slip behind for that reason. And that's mm-hmm. not, you're not taking a career break at that time. Mm-hmm. You're, you're just, you're doing your job in the in your working hours, but you don't have the extra hours that are needed to be competitive. Yeah, I mean, as you were saying before, uh, the flexibility of an academic career is a benefit in that you can schedule the time to work in the evening, say, or work on weekends instead. But it's it's when people are doing all of that uh, at the same time, working the nine to five and then working the evenings and working the weekends that you think, oh, they'll be getting ahead, whereas you may have family commitments that you need to do in the evenings or weekends instead. I think this issue about uh, having evenings and weekends free to do your research and, and publish your papers is one of the big grumbles that's rumbling on in higher education at the moment. And that that somehow you need to be seen to be utterly dedicated to your job when actually life is about so much more than the hours that you put in at the office and the extra hours that you put in at home. For me, one of the things that uh, that stressed me a lot was was the expectation that I needed to be at my desk all the time, constantly producing things. Because if you don't do that, then you don't know where the next job is coming from. And when you've come out of your PhD and you're applying for the next thing, well, it might be a two-year postdoc, it might only be a six-month postdoc. You just don't know what's going to come around the corner. But then you've constantly got that stress nagging at the back of your mind. Am I going to be employed in six months' time? And perhaps your stereotypical woman uh, thinks that that's not an acceptable compromise, whereas your stereotypical man is better able to to cope with that. I mean, I know that I'm making huge assumptions there and everyone is different, um, but I do think that the issue of short-term contracts and this expectation to go over and above what you're contracted to do is a real issue, a systemic issue across the academic sector. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I suppose my final question that leads on quite nicely from that is uh, what can we do to tackle these issues uh, that women in science face? Or humans in science face. Or humans in science face, yeah, yeah um, <laughs> to do with the academic system in general. I guess if we had a silver bullet answer to that question, then we wouldn't be sitting around this table today. I think having now got the statistics that show that the, the leaky pipeline exists is a helpful place to be. And one of the things that gets talked about is perhaps this issue of being aware of who is applying for jobs and, and potentially wanting to apply, uh, to appoint a certain percentage of men and a certain percentage of women when you when you have new positions advertised. I'm not 100% convinced that that's a good idea. As a woman, I would like to be appointed on the basis that I'm, I'm good at my job and I would be a good fit for the role rather than the fact that I'm a woman. Mm. But mm. having said that, if you, are, if you have two or three candidates that are equally well qualified for the role, then, then perhaps you do then have discretionary factors to, that can come into play, like uh, whether you're from an ethnic minority background or whether you're a female or you know, some other factor that, that you want your faculty to look more representative Mm. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer to that question Um, yeah so something that I've seen on a lot of applications uh, is universities saying we welcome applications from women in particular or people from minority ethnicities do you think that's effective in encouraging women to apply for different jobs no I don't Mm. think it makes any difference whether it says that or not Mm. okay one of the things that you hear a lot is that um, men will typically look at the essential criteria for a job and think I've got some of those I'll go for it and women are more likely to look oh I don't have some of those I won't go for it but having a note at the bottom of the thing that says we welcome applications from everybody doesn't overcome that kind of mental block about whether or not you'd be suited to do the job in the first place Mm. I suppose a lot of things start from a very young age when it comes to people's perceptions about scientists and what jobs they're going to do when they're older so it definitely is a difficult question I think just touching on the fact that you know it happens at a young age like I do a lot of outreach and I've done a lot of these like STEM networking days and it's supposed to like encourage like girls in particular to pick science subjects at school and like not be put off or think they're not good enough but when they actually do come, you find that they've already picked their subjects. So I think 
and everyone's like oh yeah we need to encourage girls in science but I think we do it too late and it should start at a much earlier age because I see people doing their GCSEs that come to these things already picking and they they might have picked like you know more art say or humanity subjects because that's what they like doing and that's fine but then it's pointless then trying to target if that's what they like then then you've not got it into them from a young age like there is an option to do science if they were questioning it mm. so I think just more on the the younger side of things like primary school or high school like for as, as soon as they get there start trying to introduce it so that it doesn't lead to this disparity as they get older yeah so you'd say more outreach um at primary school level and maybe early secondary school yeah one of the interesting things that I may be reading too much into popular culture at the moment, but um, I feel like we're almost taking three steps backwards in the perception that if you like building things and creating things and um, taking them apart and putting them back together, those are quite characteristically male traits. And and that, that really is being taught to our, our very youngest children. So it does need to start at a very early age that... Yeah. No matter who you are, you can be interested in science. Uh, well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming on today. Uh, it's really appreciated. And I think we've had some really interesting discussions. Uh, so happy Women in Science Day, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.